And joining us now here on the Black and Gold Banneret alongside Bryson Turner, I'm Eric Lopez, is the director of tennis and the head coach of the youth men's tennis program at UCF. Speak of John Roddick, back with us here. Uh, coach, good to talk to you once again. How you doing? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Good. How has the fall gone? Obviously, you got some new faces, some returners uh, from a young roster. What, what's it, what was the fall like for you? Yeah, it was. we had a good fall. I mean, uh, the guys worked really hard. Listen, we had some good results. Um, you know, a lot of improvement that, that you can that you can see. You know, we have a, a UTR where they, they they give you kind of a rating. It'll it'll move up or down. And so we had a lot of progress um, according to our UTR, which we also saw and, and felt like uh, we were we were improving. So it's always nice to see the actual data going in the right direction. Um, so it was good. I mean, we, we you know, we had fun. I mean, last year we had a tough year and learning experience, had some problems um, that we normally don't have on our team. And so, you know, this, this fall was, uh, you know, uh, just, a you know, a little bit refreshing where we learn more about tennis and, and improving and, um, you know, trying to be the best players we can be on the court. And so that was, uh, you know, we had a, we had a great fall and it was a fun fall. What was it you take away from last year? You mentioned it was a, t you played a tough schedule, some tough results that just did the ball didn't bounce your way young roster. Cause you know, from the previous year where you had that incredible run where you hosted, won the conference championships. What do you take away uh, going into this year? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about, like, you know, what you're taking away. I think it's that feeling, you know, that guys don't want to go through that again. And so some of the things that we stress, and even when we had the the great years, uh, you know, that, well, unfortunately, the pandemic year, we were, we were really rolling too. And then, um, and then in 2021, and so, you know, I, you know, I kept stressing the teams. There are a few things that I that I didn't like, even though we were having the results that we we wanted and and we were hitting all of our goals. Um, you know, and, and I think as you know, we, with a little bit of a drop in talent level with the camps turning pro, um, you know, and some other guys not playing last year, it you know that that those kind of things start showing up. So um, you know, I think there was a little bit of a learning learning process and understanding that you know, coaches just aren't on you just to be on you that the, the things we're talking about actually, you know, at, at some point will likely matter. And I think that's what, what we learned last year. We, we talked, we mentioned, we talk about that young roster coach, you of course have three for, true freshmen coming in listed on the roster right now. And I'm sure there, I believe you meant, we, we mentioned before we start recording that there are a few more, what do you like about this new crop of freshmen and how, and who do you think we could see a lot of going into this season? Well, I think, you know, what I like is that we've, the, the guys that are here that were here this fall really set the tone as far as what we're doing. So um, the, the new faces coming in January, they have to hit the ground running, but they're coming into, um, you know, a, you know, a practice arena where guys are, are doing the right things, you know, and, and like I stressed before, we, we went the right way. Um, whether those guys that improved are going to make the lineup or not, you know, we, we have a lot of decisions to make over the next two weeks um, and that's how fast we have to make them. Um, you know, I like, you know, we, we have Yassine Galimi coming in and, and he looks like he's one of the best recruits in the country overall coming in, um, you know, probably one of the top five recruits that I know of coming in. So, you know, I expect him to make a, a huge impact. We're waiting on some eligibility things with one of them um, just to see, you know, where, where, if he's going to play this year, if he's going to have to sit out. Um, you know, so we, we still have some question marks, but I think we're, we're going the right direction. I think the new guys are going to feel that. And if they they come in and just blend in with what we're doing, then, um, you know, we have a chance to have a really good year. I've noticed that uh, ben Benchacrown, if, I, if I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, yeah, Benchacrown, yeah. Benchacrown, he's been making the fall rounds a lot with the I with the ITF tournament tournaments. What have you been seeing with him this fall, and how do you, how much has he improved his game, and how much do you think we'll be seeing of him this season? Well, yeah, he's, he's definitely going to be a, a huge part of our lineup in singles and doubles. Um, he, he is a really tough out, and, and the guy's – capable of playing anybody in the country uh and, and making it into a really tough match he's a very physical player the points are long he's very good in the head um you know he's very good at counter punching his defense is good so he'll, he'll drive guys crazy that, that you know any players those, those are the kind of players that you don't like playing they just make they just make it not fun and they make it physical and mental and he's really good at doing that and he's also got a weapon with his forehand so um you know so i see him you know, we need to do our job as coaches and find a, a spot for him where he can settle in and, and win 90% of his matches. And he's, he's capable of doing that. And we have to play him in the, in the right spot. And, 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 you know, so I think we have a plan for that, but um, he, you know, he, he's going to be really good for the team and, and really valuable. 
you bring back Quinn Snyder and Cooper and Cooper White, you know, they're still listed as under underclassmen. What improvement have you seen from them over the course of this fall? And what kind of improvements do you think we could see out of them this time around? Yeah, Quinn, Quinn was one that I was alluding to uh, with the team improving. He had a huge jump with his UTR uh, from August till now. Um, you know, he started winning a lot more matches. And I think that's you, you learn to win by winning. I'm not a huge believer in you learn to lose by you, you learn to win by losing. You can learn something from a loss, but winning's a habit. And, um, you know, Quinn started to win two out of three, three out of four matches. And in tennis, that's that's kind of the goal uh, when you really start making progress as far as understanding how to work your way through matches. Cause it's, you know, we don't have a clock. You, you have to finish the match and they're going to make adjustments until the very end. And, you know, you have to be able to finish the match. And if somebody makes an adjustment late in the second or third set, you have to be able to do something to, um, to still get to the finish line. And, and Quinn's, I think took a big step in learning that this fall. So, you know, and Cooper played the best tournament that he had, you know, since he's been at UCF at regionals, he won his first round and then um, ended up losing to a, a player that ended up in the semifinals or the finals. I can't remember. Uh, and he had a match point in, in that match, actually. So um, his level was the highest that I had seen uh, really since his time here. So both of them have a chance to, you know, to be solid contributors, whether it's singles or doubles. But they're they're definitely trending the right direction for us. You mentioned, obviously, win losses. That's the ultimate, you know, deciding factor when you've seen a player, you know, develop and learn. But there are other, you know, things you could see signs of a player turning a corner. I remember in the past when we've talked about Gabe DeCamps, for example, and when you saw him turn that corner and turn out to be a top 10 player and arguably the greatest singles tennis player in the history of UCF. What, as a coach, when you see young players early on, what are some of the things you look at, either at practice or things that you see signs of that you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, there's all different ways, and, and every player is different, whether it's mental. You know, for, for DeCamps, you could always see the baseline game was – was going to be there. Um, you know, the two things he had to really work on um, that were, that were harder was, was his serve and then his mental game. You know, he could let, you know, like the, the bench at Kroon, the, the type of player that I just described with, with bench at Kroon would drive Gabe crazy. And, you know, he did, he started doing a better job of relaxing, you know, letting those matches be long, letting the points be long because they're just, you know, they're making it that way. And so, it, you know, it's like slowing down a football game or something like that when, you know, the, the other team's keeping the offense off the field. And it's just one of those slow games. And, you know, that's what drove drove him nuts. He didn't like to play slow. He wanted to play fast and play big and, you know, rip from the baseline and, and the points sometimes be a little shorter. But he had the ability to play long points as well. And so once he relaxed and realized that that was okay, you know, that's when you start seeing him, you know, turn the corner and, and not press. And so that was, you know, we, we knew the whole time that Gabe was going to be one of the best players in the country. You know, we're just – trying to hope and make sure that it's earlier rather than not right at the very end. And then he turns pro or we lose him to eligibility. Um, you know, he runs out his, his uh, eligibility clock. So, you know, for us, he started really coming around his sophomore year and, you know, was one of the best players for two and a half, three years in the, in the nation. So that was, you know, and that's what we want to see. I think Delimi has another, you know, he's another player that um, is going to be in that same mold as, as Gabe. He can, he can play with the, all the best players in the country right now. And, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, the, the mental side of it is, is, is addressed early because that's going to be the biggest challenge for, for a lot of these guys that are trying to play at that level. It's very, very taxing upstairs to, to play at that level. I know Gabe uh, is going to try to play professionally and everything. Fans have asked me, like, how is he doing? What's the status? And what, what can you tell us about how Gabe's doing? And what, what do you tell players that want to go pro, that want to play in that professional level? You've been there. You've been in that life. Yeah. You know what it takes at the highest level. What do, what's the advice you usually give the young players that want to go pro? Yeah, it's, uh, you, you know, number one, a lot of people want to do it when they're not ready. And you, you have, you can't live in this false reality. Um, you know, if you're, if you're the number 50 junior in the world, you're not close. You know, maybe the number one or two or three guys, maybe they're close. I mean, maybe, and they're not always close. It depends on the year. Um, you know, so you really have to be realistic because in our, in our game, unfortunately, you don't really make money until you're top 150 or so. And so, you know, it, that's, that's the hard part. And so if it was a different sport, say it's football or, you know, baseball, I'll use an example. If you're top 1,900 players in the world, you're going to be on a major league roster or an NFL team, and you're going to be making money. Our sport doesn't operate that way. And you got to be elite of the elite. And, you know, and so that's, that's what I try to make sure that, that people understand. And it's a, it's expensive to get there. You know, we're like golf, like you pay your own way. There's no, there's no free lunch until you get a, you know, until you sign a, a racket deal or a clothing deal. But even then, they're not going to do that until you're top 100 or a can't miss junior prospect. And so it's, it's a, you know, it, it, it's tough. It's, it, everyone wants to do it. And, and, but it's, 
that's that's the problem is everybody wants to do it so it's hard um you know and, and you know the answer to the first part of your question was how's Gabe doing he's he's doing well he's gotten up to 265 uh which is an incredibly high level he's done well in challengers which is the the level right below the the tour um you know he he's right on the verge of getting in the qualities of the grand slams which is where he'll start making some money so um so he's he's right there but he, he actually called me yesterday and he you know he's talking about how tough it is out there uh you know it's a grind it's mental you know that kind of stuff so um you know so that's that's what i try to tell you the reality is you, you don't break through quickly a lot of times and you and you gotta um you know you've got to be patient with yourself and you got to deal with failure because you're going to have bad tournaments um and then when you have a good tournament that next year when those points fall off if you if you lose first round you're going to lose all those points and if you start thinking about that and thinking, worrying about, oh, I'm losing points. I get you, you're you're done. You can't think that way. You just have to go play good good tennis, and the points will take care of themselves. You know, like when I was traveling with Andy, my brother. You know, there wasn't one time where we ever discussed, oh, well, you have so many points coming off this week. It's like, no, let's go try to win this week. You know, let's try to be in the semifinals, quarterfinals, and and have a good showing, and and see if we can win the tournament. You know, and so that was the mentality that we that we had, and it wasn't defending points i mean you play defense you're, you're out there you're gonna have problems you know there's there's always another tournament you can always adjust your schedule a little bit if you had a bad week maybe you pick up a week that you weren't gonna play um you know so it's just that you, know, you balance it and figure it out but that's that's the reality of the tours you have to be you know the elite of the elite to make a living and that's what i try to make sure players understand and that's why i think college is so important because you know you can you can be a great player in our sport and never you know make really any money playing it and so i try to really impress upon the, the the players and the kids like when they come in to not just get a degree that maybe doesn't serve them well, you know, to try to do something useful with the degree. So that way, when they decide that they want to stop, they can, you know, hop into the, the, the business world or get into coaching or whatever they want to do, but, but just make sure they've, um, you know, taken the proper steps because they're here, you know, so you may as well put that little extra bit of effort and time into, you know, getting something that's going to help you later on. You know, Coach, speaking of you and your and Andy, I, I watched this little movie a couple years back called King Richard. And during a scene when uh, they when the Williams sisters were around, were shown Rick Maggio's facility, I heard a certain name come up. Did you guys have you by any chance seen that movie yet? And what did you kind of. I, of your yeah, life? I did. I, yeah, I, I did. And I, I, I didn't know um, about it. And so when they did the premiere um my phone started blowing up and i and i didn't even know it was coming out i don't I, i'm not a huge movie goer. i knew about the movie and you know i'm like oh that's gonna be pretty cool that's right when i was there and so that that was a special time i mean we we all knew that the williams sisters were going to be you know unbelievable i mean you never know if they're going to be two of the greatest of all time which they certainly are but um we knew they were going to probably win grand slams and be top 10 in the world and and that sort of thing and and you know rick was portrayed very well in the movie that's a lot of you know, how he was. I mean, we all loved playing for him and, you know, being coached by him. He had a ton of energy. Um, he was real. You know, he, he balanced the professional side with the coaching and, you know, and that, that world is, it, it was, you know, I'd say that movie was probably 80%, 85% dead on. And, um, you know, so I, but I didn't know they were going to, you know, it's funny. They said three names in there and, and, and mine was one of them. And the other two were, you know, good friends of mine probably to this day. And um, so we were, we were talking about it laughing, but, you know, we look back and, and you kind of knew when you were there that that was a special time and a special thing to be around because there's probably 10 or 15 players that, that made it as, as pros. And so, um, you know, it was a it was a fun place and, and there's a lot of energy there. And that, I'd say that was kind of the heyday of junior development and academies and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, I had to beg my parents to let me go there for six months without them before they moved to Florida. I mean, that was that was a big deal. <laughs> Uh, for us and I was just like please like, you'll be there in May because they, they were going to move to South Florida and that's where the where Rick was actually moving and so I, I begged and begged and begged and finally they just said I think they just got tired of listening to me they said fine go and um, but it, it was a neat it was a neat time and that, that movie was was, it was unbelievably well done yeah I was as soon as when I was watching it I just heard her I when I heard your name I was like wait a minute that name sounds familiar <laughs> when I checked it I was like oh my gosh he's a UCF yeah. Well, what, so, what, what is that? What is that like? You're you're looking at watching the movie. Your name pops up. Is it like what what what's your like goes through your mind? Is your name literally popped up now? Are people in the movies, your your name is referenced in a, mo yeah. a really successful movie. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that's your personality. And then so Rick, you know, when they were talking with Rick about the movie and and who all was there, and obviously I think Andy, you know, being there. Um, but but you really, you know, like I was there when the Williams 
you know, we're, I actually, the, the movie had it backwards. It's one thing where they were already there when I got there. Um, so I don't know when exactly, you know, maybe they, I don't know, maybe they've got there like six months before. So some of those little timeline things were, were like that, but that's what it was like walking through there. I mean, you would see the best players in the country. I mean, we had, you know, the top 10 player, just an American player. I mean, forget about the international players at the time. It was, you know, the top 10 players in the 16 under and the 18 and under, 10 of them. So 50% of them were, were training there. And then you throw in the, the girls' side was the same. And then you throw in, you know, that Jennifer Capriotti was, you know, had been there and in and out. And the Williams sisters and Andrea Yeager, who ended up, you know, getting hurt, which was tragic that, that she couldn't uh, play. She was top 10 in the world. We had Kareem Alami from Morocco, who beat Sampras at the Australian Open. Christian Rude, whose son just got to the finals of the U.S. Open. Um, so he was there. So it was just a Ben Spade. It was top 20 in the world. So it was just, you know, every there's so many people there and even people that weren't there full time. The, the people that came in there when they needed a place to train when they were in Florida or coming to the U.S. I mean, it was just a, a revolving door of, you know, between Rick's and then and Nick Voltaris, who just passed away a couple of weeks ago, I believe, three weeks ago, maybe. Um, right. You know, between Nick's place and Rick's place. I mean, you'd you know, basically everyone would come through there at some point for some reason. And so it was a, you know, just in Florida in general and in Florida still that way to a point, but man, th those two places back then in the late eighties and early nineties were, were really neat. If you, if you're a tennis lover, that was the place to go hang out. It really was. How you mentioned it, you even mentioned it uh, a minute or two ago, how it's changed now. Tell us a little bit how this, how it's changed now in the sport overall, as far as developing young players back then when you were you know, around that group to now uh maybe the last handful of years how, how much has it changed yeah i think it's gotten more private so smaller so in those big group settings i i still believe they work because when you're around kids like that and and you know it, it, it takes a little bit to get going with that but parents seem to want to have just all the attention you know well i want to have the attention from somebody who's good even if it's not that much attention i want to make sure i'm learning the right things and so i think we've lost our way a little bit you know, where you'll get these guys doing it and maybe they're not the best ones to, you know, help guys become world-class or even, you know, collegiate All-American, you know, that, that type level where people have a chance to make it. And so, um, you, know, I, you know, I was around a pretty big group and I never felt like we were ignored. And, and you know, I think it's a good thing. I mean, you have to go out and earn your way every day and that's what you have to do in, in, in tournaments anyways. And, you know, so I think it was a, a great environment, but I think it's just gotten smaller. So you don't, you know, and people don't want to practice with each other. I don't want to play a practice match. You know, it's just, we just played. I mean, we just, you know, roll the balls out and we knew the day of the week if we were playing sets or we're doing drills and we just played, you know? And I mean, you really look back at all these practice matches. I don't remember winning one and losing one or who we beat or who I lost to and, you know, all that. And, you know, I'm sure the time you're all caught up into that, but, you know, you, it just, the competition was so good and, and you were in this, you know, you're always being pushed, whether it's from someone that wasn't as good as you that was coming up or you're trying to, chase the other guys or you get to the top and you're starting to, you know, play out on the tour. So, it, you know, I, I think that that environment can be very good, but um, people just want the individual thing. And I, I, I don't think that's best for the, for the players, for the, especially for teenagers. They need that social aspect and camaraderie and, you know, joking around. And it's just, it's much easier to do really difficult things and train really hard when you're doing it as a group. Um, it's just, that's why college teams are great. It's a great size. You know, we'll have 10 players and that's a great size to, to do that stuff. So, um, hopefully we trend back the other way, but I, I don't see that changing, unfortunately. You mentioned international players earlier. Two of your the two of your top players on your team this season can come from that realm. Kronje and Bogdan Bavel, both of them kind of going into their senior season. How important is it is it for them with such a young team to be in that leadership role? And what do you think we could see out of them as far as personal improvement over the, this season? Yeah, I think I think Bogdan has done a great job. Uh, he's our captain, so I'll start with him. And, um, you know, he's a fifth-year COVID senior, so he's got it. He's getting the year back that he lost from COVID right now. Um, he's excited to play. He wants to have another good year. You know, he, he's tasted both ends where, you know, we, we've done really, really well and, and achieved a lot of goals and won championships. And then, you know, last year was was unfortunate. I mean, you know, this freshman year, we were top 30. We were pretty good. You know, we were, we were on the verge of doing well. So um, I think he's hungry. You know, he was excited when – he knew we were bringing new players in. He's like, it's going to push everybody. He knew the level of the guys we're getting. So, um, you know, but it, it does it, you know, from, a, from us, from a coaching staff. And then next in line from a leadership standpoint is Bogdan. And, it's a, and that's a different leadership standpoint. So 
you know, that, that that's arguably as important or more important than what we, you know, we're going to be as coaches consistent with what we do and how we do it over the years. And the leadership on teams always fluctuate from year to year. You can ask any coach and, you know, the, my, my best years at Oklahoma when we, were, when we were number one in the country and, you know, winning national championship, it, it, we had great leadership, you know, and so I think we need that again this year. And, and we've had that in the past. And I think Boggan's ready for that. I mean, he, he had a broken wrist where he, he, he fell, um, Karen is off the scooter on the court now. I can't remember, but he, and it wasn't a terrible injury, but it, it just took a little while to heal. And he went to tournaments and played with, with one hand, you know, and, and did well and, you know, adapted his game to being able to play just with, with a one handed backhand. And, um, you know, I think guys saw that and he fought, he ended up cramping and, you know, full body cramp at the end. And, and, you know, that's the fall of a fifth year senior. He doesn't have to do that to earn his spot at this point. But I think that, you know, showed a lot to the young guys, like this is how we compete. And, and we try till the end if we can. And, um, you know, until the last ball's hit. And so, you know, fighting through an injury like that, because it wasn't affecting him. It's just, he had to play a different style. He had to come in more and he could only slice backhands. And, and, and in the end, that makes you a better player, but you're going to lose some of those matches because you're not at full strength. But um, I think he learned a lot, but I think it just sent a message to the rest of the guys. Like we're going to, we're going to fight hard this year, no matter what. Yeah, um, I also mentioned uh, Leighton Kronji as well. He paired up with Bogdan, Bogdan for the first time last season, and they 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 did a, a, some solid track together. Bogdan has been was a really great doubles player, but with Kronji, um, what do you see out of him this season? And will Kronji and P Pavel be teaming up together a lot the more this doubles pairs, or what other doubles pairs do we see? Yeah, we're we're likely looking at them to play together, and then the other two are com spots are completely up in the air. Um, but you're also talking to a coach that I, I blew up my whole doubles lineup one, two, and three the, the, for the NCAA tournament, I, I think, in 2014. So we played with three fresh teams. So I'm not afraid to make changes there either. I mean, the, you know, the, the worst thing you can do is – I mean, doubles is a, a little bit of a confidence game. And so, you know, you, you could have two we – we had two guys that, that were playing All-American level, and we had to separate them, and then we split them apart. They start playing great with lesser doubles players, and then we were stronger. So you, doubles is you, – you, you think you know, and, and I don't know that I've ever started a year and finished a year with the same teams. Uh, I would highly doubt it, but it's not a goal that I set out. It's like anything, you know, we have to adjust and, you know, and, you know, based either based on injury or based on attitudes, results. There's a lot of things that can go into it. But, but Leighton and, and Bogdan, I mean, they have a chance to be one of the best teams in the country. Um, they really do. So, you know, we'd be crazy not to start them out, um, you know, at one or two doubles and see and see how well they can do and see how many matches they can win. You know, we'd love to get back in that luxury where we had like we had Gabe and uh, Mizuchi playing two, and they they actually I think they were ranked two in the country, and then we had Trey and Bogdan, and they might have been top five at the same time. And so, you know, we'd love to to find another pairing like that. But when you have two great players too, sometimes you're better off splitting them up and then strengthening. You know, it adds depth. So we'll have to figure that out. But but you're right, like they they they're definitely our our strongest pairing right out of the gate. You know, that's for sure. We need to to put them together and see if we can figure out the other two with all the new faces and the current faces uh, of course you look at the schedule another challenging schedule unique to you're hosting the conference tournament this year at the usta center the ncaa's will be also held there your thoughts on the schedule and obviously once again hosting the conference yeah. championships yeah i didn't know if the american was going to let us host it, to be honest. <laughs> um but yeah no i mean that that's that's a, it, it says a lot about the the facility and the 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 ease of playing there as teams i mean that place was set up to host tournaments like that. And, you know, the coaches all voted the, to keep it there um, for this year because the coach, you know, as coaches, we like to go to places where it's easy. Uh, you know, your routines are easy, whatever you want. There's always courts. And so, you know, the, the hotels are great down there. So, you know, we were we were fortunate to be able to keep it. I think also if you're going to play the NCAAs there too, it's not a bad to, to, to have a, a run through the conference tournament, then turn around and come back to the same place for NCAAs, whether it's the singles tournament, the team, or, you know, whatever it is you make. So that's, that's also, I think why they, they wanted to do that. Obviously we wanted to host and because I think when we go into the big 12, we're likely at the back of the line. That's the way when I was at Oklahoma, that's the way it worked. And so uh, coming in, I can't imagine that we're going to host the conference tournament too soon, unless, you know, because it is such a great place to host. And if we host NCAs again, then, then, you know, we will probably end up hosting it, but um, you know, so I knew for us, we, if we got skipped this time, we were going to have a little bit of a wait before we even hosted the conference again. And so, um, you know, in the American, we were hosting it every other year, which was for us was awesome. Um, it's just a great venue to to do it. So we're we're excited to be hosting both of them, and um, you know, thank the American for for working with it and and you know doing what the coaches wanted to do. I think that that's that says a lot about them.
trust me, just show them photos, videos of the of the facilities, and the Big 12 coaches, I have a feeling, will change their mind. Heck, I'm sure the American kind of would still would like to, like, hey, look, we'll let you host. Can you just let us host down the road, even though you're not in the league <laughs> anymore? Because it's that yeah. special of a place uh, yeah. for there. I, I, I'm curious, too, as you transition into the Big 12, you're the director of tennis, so obviously you have a lot of hats uh, that you wear. How is that process going from your not only from the men's tennis side but obviously you work with brian on the women's side just that it you know he joked we've talked to him he joked that you know you're you're gonna give him all the dinner reservations of all the big 12 places since you know that league is high now but yeah. what, take us through that process uh you know yeah. from a tennis program standpoint in that in the transition process yeah I, I, you know from a tennis or you know really any sport i think you know just the level is going to be higher. I mean, if you're, you know, I knew when I went into Oklahoma that if we were going to win the conference, we would have to be competing for national championships too. And that's what we were able to do. And so I understand the level that we're going into, um, you know, for us on the men's side, TCU and Baylor perennial top five, top 10 teams, um, you know, UT has been there. OU, you know, has been there, dropped off maybe a little bit, but with us coming in, I think, you know, we can keep that league in the same spot from a tennis standpoint, Oklahoma state, is going to, is going to be really good. Um, in the next few years, they had, they were, took some lumps last year with being young, but, um, you know, to, to win that conference and it's not going to change. I mean, you see TCU in the national championship of football, you know, to win the conference, you need to be, you know, you basically need to be top 10 in the country. Um, you know, I don't know in tennis, a team ever outside the top 10 has won the conference. I, I would highly doubt it. Um, so we, that's just the, the benchmark. And, and that's why we want to go in the conference in the first place. Um, so, you know, so that's part of it. Now, the women's is a little different because they have more teams because the North, a lot of the Northern schools in the nineties dropped their men's tennis programs, unfortunately, and they haven't, they haven't brought them back. So um, his schedule is going to look a little different than ours. Um, they'll have a, a much beefier, you know, more filled up conference schedule than we do, but um, the level is still the same. I mean, you know, I've seen the big 12, I've seen years where the team that finished last in the big 12 was ranked 23 in the nation um, out of six teams. So that's what we were facing every every weekend and then at the conference tournament and, and, you know, so that's what we have to look for. I mean, that's why when we were recruiting, we had, we had a player that we know is a good player and he, he might have to sit out a year on the front end, but we wanted him. So when we entered the big 12, that's what we had, you know? And so that was the thought process on recruiting. We had a lot of, and we knew we had three other guys coming in and like, well, if we need to do this, we need to do this um, because you, you don't find guys at that level that often. So, um, so that's, you know, the mentality that we're taking and, you know, definitely want to, win this conference on the way out, but we were definitely looking towards the future in that first year, because, you know, if we're, if we're 35 in the nation, 40 in the country, I mean, and you go into the big 12 and do that, we're going to get, we're going to get walked all over. Um, you know, every team there is typically a tournament team. Um, and so that's what we're, you know, it's, it's a little bit like men's basketball, you know, where it's just really strong top to bottom. And if you slip up at all, you're not winning games. I mean, I've seen teams 23 in the country go, oh, go winless in the conference and still make the tournament. You know, that's how that's how tough it is. And I know that sounds so weird when you say it out loud that teams do that. But but that's the way it is. You know, no, and so we, we yeah. So we know that. And so we that's what we got to get ready for. And, and it's a, that's exciting. I mean, we're going to attract that level of recruit, too, when you're playing that way. And we're in Florida, which uh, I think recruiting the Big 12, that that has to help us and help our cause a little bit. Well, yeah, it's true. I mean, the Big 12 basketball is a great example you brought up. I mean, every night there's no nights off. I mean, it's. Yeah. It's quality high level, uh, and it's the same in tennis. So I, it's a great comparison you made there. It's a great point. Bryson, go ahead. Yeah. You get that Big 12 sneak peek a little bit this season where Texas, when Texas comes to Orlando to face you guys in March, but you also have some really notable matchups. You face Ohio State, number two ranked in the country right now, twice this season, 98 kickoff, and then they come to Orlando later. You got Florida, FSU, even SMU's receiving votes. What was your kind of thought process in assembling this and this, this schedule for this team this season? Well, I think our schedule is a little softer than last year. Um, you know, because we scheduled thinking we were going to have a certain roster and then we didn't um, with, with some guys turning pro. But, um, you know, our schedule is good. I mean, I, I like the schedule. Um, it, it's, you know, Ohio State, the kickoff weekend, that that was, you know, that's a draft in June. So we just got that draw. I mean, I chose to go there. Um, I like their courts. They're, you know, they used to have this ridiculous home court advantage and they and they still do to a point, but the courts were pretty tough to play on. And, um they, now they have this beautiful new facility, but I actually feel like it's easier to play there uh, than it was. And so, you know, when you pick where we picked in that, you're, you're really looking at, okay, we, we're going to have to play a really tough team, but let's, you, you, if we do lose, we want, we don't want to go 0-2 there either. 
you know, so you're sometimes looking, even if we lose the first one, that's okay. You know, but if we, if we win that one, then we're, we're looking really good in that second round. And then if we don't, there's a consolation there. So you're playing two matches. So your whole thought process isn't necessarily just on the first match you play and, you know, who you're playing right there. So, you know, so that was part of the, the thought process of, of going to Ohio State. And, and I also thought the court, we played really well there last year. We lost, but we, that was actually probably the best we've played the whole year. And so, you know, if we're going to have to go indoors, we wanted to go back there because I didn't feel like for us coming from Florida and not being inside that much, I felt like there we could actually play pretty good tennis. So we, um, so that's, that's why we went there. We didn't, you know, we picked low, so our options weren't great. You know, we were looking around and, you know, we're like, no, that's not, a, you know, some of these courts are really fast. We're not even going to be able to prepare for that. So that's why we did that. And then we scheduled them anyway. So they're, they're outside here, which that's, you know, that's the match you want to circle is like, you know, them coming from indoors to outdoors um, and coming to Florida for one of their first outdoor matches. I mean, we did that at OU and we, you know, just put how it worked. We, we beat them outdoors really badly after they'd won in Ohio State actually won indoors and then the, the next time we had won indoors national indoors and then we beat them at their place but it was a it was a you know four three we saved match points and you know it was a tough one I mean we actually broke their 200 match winning streak they had a 200 match home winning streak that we broke um, wow it was the, the most in the history of the NCAA in any sport 200 matches and uh we we got it. they had match point to beat us and we somehow slimed out the match um but yeah, so that's, you know, tennis is that we're, we're like basketball. I mean, if you go, you know, it, it, your goal is not to go undefeated every year. There's very few teams that ever do. And sometimes I've seen the team that goes undefeated in the regular season, they get really tight in the tournament with that undefeated staring them right in the face. So, you know, I never set up the schedule trying to, trying to go undefeated. If you do, that's great. You know, we want to win every match, but I never set up the schedule thinking, you know, afraid to lose matches. Like that's not, that's not how we schedule at all. Like that's, you know, we, we, we made the finals the NCAAs at OU uh, and we lost 10 matches that year, you know, so it's not, that's not how we, how we operate. I mean, like last year, but then it got out of control because the schedule was too tough for, for us, but so it's a balance, but uh, usually, usually it works out well. So um, this year's schedule, I think for the, the, the talent level we have, our youth, I think the schedule is really fair. It's going to be a tough, a tough test for them at times, but then there's going to be a lot of winnable matches that we need to win. So that, that's how we, how we try to set that up. What are what is the biggest thing you want your team to get out of this season? Well, I think you know going into the Big Twelve, I, I want to just create that that winning habit again. We had that going, and then we stumbled last year, and so um, just getting the, that habit of winning and expecting to win, not getting too excited if you beat a team that's thirty in the country. That's a good win, you know. That's a very good win. I'm not discounting it at all. I mean, sometimes we've been at that ranking, and but we want to expect that and and have that be you know, just kind of business-like and you go out and take care of business and, and win that match and go on to the next one. You know, that's not what we should be getting excited about. That's what we are supposed to be doing. So that's, you know, that's the mentality we want to develop as we move through this year. And I think we, you know, going back to your first question about the fall, you know, I think we moved into that mentality. Now we just have to go out and, and finish those matches and, and with a W. And so that's, that's the idea. You know, I think it's a, it's a really good test. And I think that's what we want to build. It's just, you know, a certain level of expectation, like this is where we're going to be. And then at the end of the season is that you get into later rounds of either the conference tournament or the NCAA, you know, let's try to win something now. So, you know, that's, that's what we want to do. Well, we're going to be excited uh, before, you know, the season's here. I mean, at all levels, Australian open is going to get underway. Your co college season, the spring gets underway coach. Always exciting to see your program. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time. I know it's a super busy time. Uh, but we always enjoy uh, having you on when we can, and uh, we look forward to seeing you out there at the USDA Center. Of course, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Enjoy coming on.